an estimated 250 to 300 million families are trying to subsist in the tropics as a whole by slash and burn and broadly speaking failing it's it's trapping them in poverty in the Honduras rainforest, the Inga Foundation saves the rainforest from being slashed and burned. For years, Mike and his team have been helping farmers turn their burning practice into a planting practice. By teaching a carefully developed and sustainable practice, farmers stop their burning and break out of poverty. This is a complex problem, so watch how this solution has evolved into the most successful program for the humid tropics. These are the descendants of the same people who came maybe 120 years ago with axes and machetes, cutting down the primary rainforest. And it's the descendants of those first pioneers who are now restoring their own landscape. We were honoured when the Inga Foundation reached out to us to explain how their work stops farmers from burning the forests. Inga helps farmers to actually start planting to regenerate the land, the forests and nature. This means sustainable agriculture with 100% food security. And 674,000 tonnes of carbon has been sequestered or avoided from being burned up in the atmosphere since 2012. And the numbers are growing. We're using Inga alley cropping as the heart of a, a much wider system. Now we're doing proof of concept at landscape scale in order to convince people that regreening and res restoration of thoroughly degraded landscapes is actually possible. And it's done by the families themselves. There's a farming method called slash and burn farming that's causing some serious damage to the climate. With this farming method, farmers cut down trees and then burn them to clear an area to plant crops. This practice has been very common among subsistence farmers from time immemorial. Subsistence farmers are farmers who live only on the crops they grow and the livestock that they breed. Unfortunately, the slash and burn farming technique is not only rapidly destroying the remaining rainforests that we have, but it's also pumping billions of tons of carbon into the atmosphere every year. Yikes! And to make matters worse, it's not just the environment that's taking a hit, it's also devastating for the ecosystems, making land infertile and rapidly driving wildlife into extinction. In Honduras, for example, the entire country has been deforested and what has done it is subsistence agriculture. For more than 250 million farmers worldwide who engage in slash and burn farming, this method of farming is the only way to survive. And each time they slash and burn an acre of land, they release roughly 5 to 100 tons of carbon into the atmosphere. In comparison, on average, you emit one ton of CO2 for about every 4,000 kilometers or 2,500 miles that you drive. That is a whopping 1,480,000 kilometer drive, or roughly the equivalent of Kanye West driving from Washington DC to Las Vegas and back 150 times. An estimated 250 to 300 million families are trying to subsist in the tropics as a whole by slash and burn and broadly speaking failing it's it's trapping them in poverty but why would you intentionally burn the forest what was it that prevented people from settling on one piece of land the slash and burn method has a ripple and lasting effect on both the soil and the environment you can employ the slash and burn method of farming this year and think that everything is okay but the nutrients that once were in the ground have been depleted, and there are no plants there to continue adding nutrients to the ground. This will result in farmers burning a new piece of land, and then the next, and then the next. They burn and clear the land in search of fertile land. This is called shifting cultivation. You only have to continue this long enough before you turn an entire forest of green vegetation into one dry hard ground where nothing edible grows, and as a result, many rare species of both plants and animals are slowly moving towards extinction. The soils I've been seeing here can be hundreds of thousands of years old, millions perhaps, and the weathering 
and the loss of nutrients is profound. So when you look at the whole situation, how does one tackle this tough issue? People think oh, it's so naive, well just give them tractors and fertilizers. You know, for one thing, the families we're working with, they're farming one in one slopes, in some cases, steeper than one in one. Uh, it's a special set of complex problems that have come together. It's the social, economic, environmental, they're about basic soil quality. There are all sorts of other aspects of poverty that kick into it. But a problem, a mass problem, a complex problem like that, requires an integrated solution. So that's what started my interest. But I was already determined to try, based on the work I'd done around what looks like a sustainable system, what can we learn from indigenous practice and from other stuff too, good soil science. Mike, together with Cambridge University, researched into the effects of slash and burn. From this research, they were able to develop an innovative farming technique that is a game changer. The result of this is called the Inga Tree Model, and it's been transforming lives and entire landscapes for the past 11 years. It restores degraded land that would have been further degraded by slash and burn. Once the families have food security, and also growing something for cash, they no longer have to say, you know, that hectare over there I'm saving to do slash and burn next year or the year after that. They say, yeah, we'll plant fruit trees and certainly in some cases, timber. The Inga tree model mimics the rainforests and it's an organic, sustainable and low cost technique. This technique is ingenious in that it gives farmers the ability to improve and feed their families while keeping the rainforest and its rich biodiversity intact. We're using Inga alley cropping as the heart of a, a much wider system. So essentially we're extending to these families two forms of alley cropping with Inga, one for basic grains and one managed a little bit differently for cash crops. So the family can grow something to sell rather than just something to eat. But what exactly is the Inga tree model? Who is Mike Hans and how did a tropical ecologist come up with a solution that stops the burning of the rainforests? What you've effectively got is a rainforest under the control of the farmer that's never allowed to be developed into a rainforest. It's, it's a would-be rainforest, but it never becomes one because you're, you're attacking it once a year. Mike Hans, the founder of the Inga Foundation, was riddled with a burden born out of the obvious damage that the slash and burn farming system was causing, not only to the environment, but also to the lives of subsistence farmers who practice it. Unfortunately, many farmers all over the world still engage in this practice because they have no alternative. We've lost count of the number of trees that have gone in, but we think it's at least five million. But the truth is, most of the five million have been planted by the families themselves. And I love that because there's a symmetry there. These are the descendants of the same people who came maybe 120 years ago with axes and machetes cutting down the primary rainforest, uh, what we would say in English, carving out their own future. They've handed the land down through many generations now. And it's the descendants of those first pioneers who are now restoring their own landscape. So how does this model work? So planting trees, that's nothing new. What makes this method so special? Well, quite a lot. So let's get into the details. The beauty of the Inga method is how plants, trees and decomposition work together. The trees are planted in rows to form an alley and are allowed to grow. Before pruning the trees, basic grains such as maize, rice or beans are planted. Then pruning begins. While pruning, the green leaves of the Inga tree are stripped from the branches and the branches are used for firewood. The leaves are left to decompose on the ground, serving as protection for the seeds, manure for the soil and weed control. Weed control in two ways. The first is when the Inga canopy closes over, it's, it just simply destroys the weeds because there's no sunlight. It's, it's dark in the Inga alleys before you prune. You prune and then you smother the soil with six, eight inches or you know, 15, 20 centimeters of mulch. So the weeds, even if they germinate, 
they can't get through. Got so it. you do it two. It's an alternating system. So to summarize, the pruned branches provide a year's worth of valuable firewood and no standing trees are cut down entirely. As the leaves are left on the ground, the farmers are left with a soil that is fertile and with enough nutrients for growing seeds. Farmers can now plant basic grains, fruits, and vegetables. As the new plants grow and the leaves decompose, they sprout from the protective layer and obtain more sunlight, but the trees also grow and shade out the weeds. It's a beautiful dance between the sun, plants, trees, and decomposition. But that's not all. This farming method is actually even more beneficial in other ways. This method actually also helps the farmers grow food even in the worst conditions. The Inga tree farmers are thriving despite the hurricanes, heat, and drought as the shade of the trees protects the plants from the scorching sun and the roots prevent the soil from being washed away. These are very resilient trees. They have a 99% survival rate. Demand is huge, while neighbors who use the slash and burn method are left to watch their crops dry up or wash away. Additionally, the alleys create biological corridors, increasing biodiversity. Birds return after planting with small rodents and mammals finding food in the mulch. Large cat animals have also been spotted in alleys hunting the mammals. But we're also rehydrating the landscape. And it's that rehydration that I've come to realize that rehydration is a key factor. And we're seeing many families and on our own demonstration farm. We've got three springs of water that were not there before the trees were planted. Fresh, clean water coming out of the ground that didn't exist. Other families are saying the same because you're restoring the organic matter into the soil, which is the sponge that's holding the water and releasing it slowly. And it's that that has been destroyed by repeated slash and burn. The results of this technique are fascinating, but how did Mike come up with this method? So what we did was to create big research plots between two basic treatments. One was with alley cropping using legume trees. The point about the legumes is that they fix nitrogen so that a, a subsistence farmer does not have to buy fertilizer nitrogen. The other treatment was bare soil, which is just what farmers do. They, 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 after a slash and burn operation, you have bare soil. So you've got four combinations. It's either got alley cropping or bare soil. It's got rock phosphate applied once or nothing. Now, to, to cut the whole thing short, we got an immediate response to the application of the rock phosphate, and it was still there seven years later. We were getting more yields uh, of basic grains, and the phosphorus content of the basic grain was higher, so it's better quality food. And the answer is, you don't use fertilizer phosphate that gets washed through the soil profile by the rain. You use the forms that are slowly available and let the trees bring it into circulation. Wait, what? A rock phosphate mineral mix? What is that? And why is it called the magic mixture by the local farmers? Allow us to briefly explain. As the soil is depleted of phosphorus when the land is burned, a small amount of mineral rock phosphate, lime and potassium magnesium, needs to be added to the thick mulch, but only once every five years. Perhaps you can say it's like adding a shot of vitamins to the soil, revitalizing it in a way that isn't washed away by the rain like industrial fertilizer. The local farmers call this the magic mixture, as it's something that only needs to be added once every five years, and not for every so. Quite remarkable, right? Now let's get back to Mike. Now the other thing that came out of it was alley cropping with those species that were recommended failed. Within, I'd say, three to four years, the yields were going down, the weed, they were, it was failing to control the weeds properly. And what, what came out of the, the whole seven-year experiment was the only system with a promise of sustainability was alley cropping with Inga. With the research in place, it was now time to put it into action. The Inga Foundation raised funding and got started with helping farmers start to use this new system. It was time to end the slash and burning of the rainforest. 
The Inga tree model is unique in that it's the families of the subsistence farmers that make all the decisions. Farmers provide the land, labour and care needed to incorporate this farming method. The Inga Foundation's All Honduran team provides the training, seeds and assistance that the farmers need, especially with their first pruning in 18 to 24 months. At the moment, Inga Foundation policy is we provide everything that they need because we're determined to set up a, a big project at landscape scale so that we can prove changes in the landscape. And it's done by the families themselves. We're not going in and, well, we do plant trees, but the, you know, the, whatever it is, four or five or six million trees that have gone into the ground since this project began, most have been planted by the families. The results and changes thanks to the Inga Foundation have been incredible. Since 2012, the Inga Foundation's Land for Life program, which is based in Honduras, has significantly transformed the lives of more than 450 subsistence farming families. Additionally, after 20 years of scientific proof of concept, this farming method has assisted more than 3,000 people and has regenerated over 2,600 acres of highly degraded land. That's as much as 13 standard football fields of Inga trees per family. It's no wonder that the Inga Foundation was selected to be a Keeling Curve Prize for carbon removal. The Foundation was also a scale finalist for food security. This is remarkable, and we can't wait to see this grow. So, what does the future hold for the Inga Foundation? What I'd see our future is, is we're establishing a teaching and training facility. But, so there's 15 other countries, and I would see us as the sort of training facility for that, rather than we try and do everything across the entire globe. We can't do that, but we can train other people. The work that the Inga Foundation does is entirely dependent on donations and volunteers. We've added a few links below, if you want to contribute to their work of saving the rainforests from being cut and burned, and, at the same time, helping farmers to escape poverty. Mike stresses the significance of building trust and cooperation with the local community. Inga's achievements are the result of getting farmers on board by starting at the grassroots level. The Honduran team has facilitated Inga Alley replication in 15 countries with farmers, NGOs and government groups by providing training with the nurseries, providing over 400,000 cacao plants and 85,000 pepper plants for cash crops. More than 200,000 hardwood tree saplings have been distributed. We, we've lost count of the number of trees that have gone in, but we think it's at least 5 million. We're proud to say that the audience of Symbiosis are people engaged in environmentalism all over the world, but some have yet to start. So what advice would you give to someone who discovers a problem and wants to take action on their own? First, find out what's the conventional thinking that says the problem's are insoluble. What have people done that leads them to that conclusion? Because I think no, I can't think of one that's insoluble. Just question question assumptions, read widely, think, read outside the box, think outside the box. It was the box that was stopping this. There was a box of thought, uh, sort of contradictions were, were being woven into the, uh, the scientific picture that required resolution, it required unpicking. And as an ending statement, we just want to encourage you to donate to or volunteer with the Inga Foundation. You can be a part of this incredible movement. Your support will help them to expand their reach, establish teaching and training facilities, and convince policymakers to adopt this transformative technique on a large scale. Together, we can save our rainforests, combat climate change, and uplift communities. We've added a link in the description, so go ahead and visit their website to donate and join their mission today. Let's create a greener and more sustainable future for all.